Hello and welcome to Emergency R, where the goal is to get you going with your data as fast as possible. So in this tutorial I'm going to show you how to make graphics using the ggplot2 package. Now there are utilities for graphics in the base R installation as well, but ggplot2 is really quick and easy to learn. And so we're making plots for a variety of reasons, and one that you might think not think of is that you can use plots to discover problems with your data. You might see a relationship between two variables that doesn't make sense, and then you have to go back and look and see what's wrong with the data. And of course, you can use graphics to gain insight about the trends and associations you have in your data set. And lastly, and probably what you're here because you want to do, is that you can use graphics to communicate your results to others. So the learning objectives today are to be able to visualize relationships among variables in a data frame. You're going to learn about the components of a plot in ggplot, including aesthetics, geoms, coordinates, scales, and facets. And you're going to learn how to expo export your plots to a file. Now I'm giving a quick overview in this video, but there are lots of online resources for this package, so I recommend going to ggplot2.tidyverse.org to learn more. So here I have uh, my script from an earlier video. Um, you can get this file, this CSV file, from a GitHub site in the description if you haven't been following along with the videos that preceded this one. And this is the code for importing that data into R. So I'm actually going to make a new script and then I'll copy and paste these lines for the beginning of my of my script because I'm going to, of course, want to load the data in here as well. And so if you need a quick refresher, how I ran that line was I put my cursor on the line, the, the line one here, and I press control and enter. If you like using the mouse, you can also click the run button. Okay, so first off, we need to actually install ggplot2. So that command is install dot packages. In fact, I have a nice completion here. Use install dot packages, not installed packages. And I'm going to type in the name of the package that I want, which is ggplot2. And in fact, I'm going to show you another one that I like for really nice color schemes. So we'll install that one as well, and it's called Viridis. So run each of those two lines. Okay. We'll take a moment to download it and get it installed. And then what I'm going to do with these lines, so you're learning, you probably want to keep them around to remember how to install packages. So instead of deleting them, I'm going to do what's called commenting them out, which means I put a hash symbol in front and then I can't accidentally run them again. So you, you've installed the package already, you don't need to install it again, but this way you can have a reminder of how you did it. Now what you will need to do every time you run this script is you'll need to load the packages and you do that with a command called library. And in this case I don't need to put quotes around the name of the package. R is just a little inconsistent that way. If you do put quotes around the name of the package it doesn't hurt. Okay, so I'm going to load those two packages by running those two lines. And so now that I have the packages loaded and I have my data frame, I can start out making a scatter plot. So this will show us the relationship between two variables. So I'm going to type the command ggplot. Notice that the package is called ggplot2, but the command is just ggplot with no 2. And the next argument for this function, or the first argument for this function, is your data frame. So I'm going to type in the name of my data frame right there. The next argument for the function is your aesthetics, and that is telling ggplot how are your variables going to correspond to aspects of the plot. 
So I create that with a function called AES, short for aesthetics. I'm going to put another set of parentheses after that. And then let's say x is, we'll pick our comb diameter, stem diameter variable. And y, let's go with height. All right, so if we remind ourselves of the structure of this data set, those are two numeric variables that we had in the data set. Um, and you'll notice before you may have seen me um, getting to, to those variables something like this where I type in the name of the data frame and then I follow that up by typing in the name of the variable. But ggplot is smart enough that it will recognize that this is a column from this data frame. So then you don't have to type the name of the data frame over and over again. And you'll notice I put a plus after this because if I didn't and I ran this all by itself, it sets up the plot, but it doesn't plot anything. So what we need after that, I'm going to press plus and then I'm going to make a new line. And then I'm going to do something called a geom. And you see I start typing that in and it fills in fills in all sorts of them in, a, in an autocomplete list for me. Um, I recommend if you want to make a particular kind of plot just browsing through this list. But the one that I want is point for a scatter plot. And that's a function so I'm going to put parentheses after it but I don't have any additional arguments for it so I don't need to put anything inside those parentheses. So then if I hit control enter to run that it gives me a warning because there was some missing data in there, but it makes a, a scatter plot of these two variables. So I can see the relationship between the variables. Now one uh, important thing to let you know about before um, we get too far with this, if you're getting stuck already where you're putting in commands and nothing is happening, so for example, say I, I commented out that geom point and I just ran the ggplot thing with a plus. Um, you'll see normally down here, I'm down in the lower left, uh, I have this greater than sign as my prompt for R. And now I have a plus sign for a prompt. And that means that there was an incomplete command. So I might have run this and said, hey, nothing happens. And then I run it again and still nothing happens and I'm wondering what's going on. If there's a plus sign here, just put your cursor down here. So click the mouse in the lower left so it's blinking there. And then press the escape key on your keyboard and that will get you back to the caret prompt so you can start running commands again. It just, the plus just means that it's waiting for a command to be completed and it's really easy to mess that up when you have multi-line commands. Right, so this geom point was the conclusion of the command. The plus tells R that it's waiting for more information. Now that I've written a bunch in this script, let's take an opportunity to save it. So I'm going to call it learning ggplot.r. Whatever you call it, just put a dot r at the end. Now as a quick exercise, try plotting some of the other variables together, including some of the categorical variables like loc. Okay, so say I want to plot some other variables, like I was looking at yield before. So let's plot cone diameter versus yield. Now this isn't a great plot because as you noticed before, if you recall from the last video, we log transformed yield. Um, just because that's how the data are normal. Um, this is a, a, a value that increases exponentially as the plant is kind of bigger and healthier. Right, so we might want to log transform it on the y-axis here as well. And how we do that is with something called chord. So if I start typing chord, there are a whole bunch of options here. And what I want is chord trans for transform. And so because I want to transform the y-axis, I'm going to say y equals, and then in quotes, I'm going to put log. And so if I hit control enter and run that, 
Now I have the y-axis transformed. Now, how did I remember how to do all that? Uh, I need to show you how to look at help pages. So I put my cursor down here in the lower left. I'm going to type quest question mark and then chord trans. And what that does is it pulls up the help page. And so here it shows me, here are what all the different arguments are for um, for this function. Um, you'll notice I put y equals instead of just putting log, and that's because I was completely skipping this x argument. So if I'm, if I'm giving arguments that aren't in the order, um, in the same order that they're specified here, then I actually need to name them like this. And so if I look down, there's some examples. And let's see. All right, so if we go here to trans new, there's a list of transformations that work. So it's a little convoluted, but if I scroll down, I can see all of the various different transformations that I could have put. Um, so basically any of these, the first part of it, I could have put in quotes in here and it would have worked for transformation. Now your next question might be, how can I add a trend line? And we actually do that by adding another geom. So you can have multiple geom commands in the same ggplot command. So I'm going to copy and paste this command for our scatter plot where we did uh, comb diameter and height. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add uh, one more command. So I'm going to put a plus sign after geom point. And then I'm going to type in geom smooth, which is the command for adding a trend line. So now if I run this thing, I can see that there's a curve fit to the data, as well as a gray area around that curve showing a margin of error. Now often what you actually want is a straight line that's the best fit to the data. So let's look at the help page for geom smooth to see how we might do that. And I see I have an argument here called method. And auto means it just will pick the best method. But if I scroll down, I can see some other options. And I have one called LM. Now LM is the name of the standard function in R for building linear models. So you know y equals a plus bx types, type models. So I'm going to use that argument. And so if I run it again like that, now I have a trend line for that data. Let's see what I, happens when I do that with my transform data. So I'll take this command and I'll copy and paste that into my uh, scatter plot for making yield. Scatter plot for looking at yield. And uh, I get some errors and stuff. So actually, anything that involves math with your data, you want to do the transformation before the math happens rather than after. So coordinate uh, transformation, this command kind of is the last thing that will happen. It changes how the data are plotted, but not how the data are analyzed. So I'm going to get rid of that because that's causing a problem for me. And one thing I can do instead is I can actually transform the yield right there. Right, and so now the disadvantage is that I don't have the actual yield values on the, the y-axis. I have the log transformation of them, but at least now I can fit a trend line. The other thing you can do, so there's a command called scale log scale y, yeah, scale y, and we'll pick the one that's log 10. So that's also going to scale the y-axis before plotting. So that will do the same thing, but at least now on the, on the y-axis we have values that make sense. So what I want you to do now is take a few minutes to explore your own data or explore other variables in this data and make some scatter plots like that. 
You should also try transforming axes and adding trend lines like we just did. And another thing I want you to try is take these two commands and just switch the order of them and see what happens. So pause this video and try that out. Okay, welcome back. I hope you explored your data for a few minutes and maybe learned some interesting things. So here's the answer to what happens if I switch the order of my geoms. If I do that, now you see the trend line is underneath the points instead of on top of it. So these are plotted in the order that they're listed, and the next one is plotted on top. All right, so that can be very helpful uh, for making your plots look exactly like you want them to. Now since these data are very dense, another thing I might want to do is get a better look at their density. So I could even add a third geom, Oops. geom density, and here I want a 2D density plot, as opposed to if I just had one variable I could do a 1D density plot. And I'm going to add the plus after that because I still want my scaling. And now I see kind of a topographic map of these uh, points. And say I want my trend line on top again. I can put that there. And it's the same color as the curves for the density, so maybe I don't like that. I can actually specify the color of the line right here. So if I want it to be red, I can type in red instead and change it. All right. So let's move on. You'll notice we have some categorical variables in our data set. So for example, one of them was location. So if I look at that, right, I had those six locations. So how can I visualize those in my plot? Let's take this plot over here and modify that command. So for now, I'll get rid of my, my curves and my trend line. So one thing I can do is I can set a color in my aesthetics up here. And I can say color is location. So you notice before up here, I set the color outside of an aesthetics call, and that's if you just want the whole thing to be one color. If I put the color inside an aesthetics call, that means I want the color to have something to do with this variable and you know, tell me what value of the variable I have. So if I do that, now I've got this nice color key, and I can see all of my points by color in here. But maybe that's not the most readable thing. Another thing I can do, say we're going to put comb diameter aside for a moment, and say I just want to understand how yield is related to location. I'm going to put that on the x-axis. Actually, I'm not 100. This is not a good idea for a plot, so I'm not 100% sure what that's going to look like. Yeah, so this isn't great because you see a bunch of points, but you don't have a good sense of their distribution. But I can use another geom, like box plot, to instead see how that's distributed for each location. Now you might go back to this plot and say, oh, but I really want to understand the relationship between these two numeric variables and how that changes from location to location. And you know, what it would be really nice if was, would be if I had a different plot for each. So that is what facets are for. So I'm gonna get rid of the coloring here, but instead, I'm going to, why did it indent there? See, yeah, things will, so R will automatically indent stuff for you, and if it does it in a way that you're not expecting, that's a good sign that something's wrong. And I can see, if I look at those last parentheses here, it highlights the matching parentheses, and that's for AES, 
but I've lost my matching parentheses for ggplot. I must have deleted it by accident. So I'm going to type another parentheses, and now that's filled in. Right, and yeah, I have a little x that's just telling me that there's the command isn't finished. These little x's, sometimes they take, I don't know, even five or ten seconds to disappear after you fix the problem. So if you fix a problem and so still see the x, don't, don't panic right away. Um, so the uh, command I want here is facet wrap. And I'm going to put in a tilde right here. To R, a tilde means you're basically creating a formula. And for the facets, you, you have to do that um, <laughs> without getting too deep into it. So I want to facet by location. And so now what that does is it makes that scatter plot, but it makes it six times, and it, it's basically made it once for each location. I could even add my trend line back. Let me just copy and paste that. Copy and paste is your friend once you have something that's working. So now I've got a trend line for each site. So I can see, oh, that's kind of different. Like, oh, and in the CHA site, there really was no relationship, but there was a pretty strong relationship other places. OK, so what I'd like you to take a moment to do for an exercise right here is a different kind of facet wrap. So if you remember, we have a variable called CSERC. This is the compressed circumference of the plant, basically. If we pull it all together tight and put a measuring tape around it, how big is it? So let's divide this into two groups. So we'll say CSERC is greater than 25. So take a few minutes and see what happens when you do that, and maybe explore other variables and combine this with other things that you've learned. Welcome back. I hope you learned something interesting. So if I run this command, excuse me for a moment there, right, then I get the data set actually divided into three groups. Um, so depending on whether um, the compressed circumference was greater than 25, so that would be the true category, whether it was less than or equal to 25, which would be the false category, and then a few where there was no compressed circumference data. OK, let's talk more about colors. So let's take our plot from before. I'll get rid of the facet wrap just to make things a little easier to look at. And I'll get rid of the trend line, too. Say that now I want to be able to see column diameter, yield, and height all in one plot. I could color by height. So before we colored by location, which was a categorical variable, so it gave us six different colors. So this way, if we're coloring by a numeric variable, it will automatically make a color scale for us. So if we do that, we have a scale of uh, this dark blue to light blue. And actually, I see a lot of gray because there were quite a lot of um, places where height was missing, but other things were, uh, were measured. In fact, I will take a related trait, which was abbreviated CML. Yeah, that should be a little bit better filled in. So now we can see, OK, as a general trend, the, the plants that were Higher yielding uh, tend to have longer column length. Maybe to some extent, the ones with uh, higher column diameter tend to have higher column length. And one thing that I didn't point out before, uh, which is really handy if you have a very dense plot like this, is you can set something called alpha, which is the transparency. So say I want it to be about 50% transparent. Now I have a little better bit 
better way to, to see this and see all of the density of everything. In fact, I might even set the alpha to a lower value. And then things are really transparent and I can really see, okay, here's this, this densest area that I have here. But since we're going from a dark to light color and then we're also the the transparency is kind of showing things darker where it's more dense. It's a little bit confounding and hard to look at. So let's pick out a different color scheme. Right, and this is why I had you install Viridis because this is one of my favorite color schemes. Everything in the Viridis pack, uh, package is not only very easy for normal people to visualize, but it's also friendly for colorblind people. We'll crank this alpha back up a little bit. And so if I do that, I get this purple to blue to green to yellow. And now it's very easy for me to visually map that back to this scale that I had. If I want to look at the help page, it gives me some different options. So I can actually set the alpha in here if I wanted to for what the scale should be. Uh, it has a begin and end if I only wanted part of that uh, scale, like if I didn't want the purple or something like that. Um, direction if I wanted it to go in the opposite direction. And there are some options. Uh, so I think, uh, yeah, Viridis is the default, but like there's another one called Mag Magma. If you want something that looks a little bit more, oh, option without an S. See, I, yeah, it said unused argument, which usually means I named some argument incorrectly. So if I do that, now I see sort of a cold to hot uh, scale, uh, which maybe more intuitively tells you that a value is lower or higher. Okay, so what if I wanted to go back to coloring by location? So I change color back to location. And then it says discrete values applied to a continuous scale. So the way this is set up, it's for something that's numeric rather than something that's categorical. Although if I look here, I see that I have an argument called discrete. So if I set discrete, equals true. Now it's going to work again and it's going to use that color scheme. But maybe I don't really like that color scheme and I want to make my own. More importantly, maybe I used some other software to make a plot that I'm going to publish in the same paper and I really want the colors to match. So I can create my own color scheme. So I'm going to come out comment out this scale color Viridis line, and then I'm going to put in a different scale color line to make my own color scheme. So the command is scale color manual. And if I want to set uh, values for something discrete, I say values equals and then I type a lowercase c. We'll talk about this more when we talk about vectors in a different video. And then parentheses. And inside that, I'm going to put a series of statements where I say something equals something else. So say I want CHA equals blue and CSU equals green. And I'm making a line break just because my screen is very small here. R will ignore the line break, so that's fine. Maybe HU equals red, KNU equals purple, let's say NEF equals brown, and ZJU equals black. Maybe not the greatest color scheme, but you know, a bunch of colors I can name. If you Google R colors or colors in R, you will get a list of all of the named colors. There are hundreds of them. Um, 
All right, so now I have I have a color scale that I made myself, and I can see how these colors match up. Uh, it, you know, it still creates the legend for me. Um, so those are built-in colors to R, but say uh, I have a color where you know it was a specific color for another piece of software, and I really want to match it exactly. Uh, there is a function called RGB. In fact, let's look at the help page for that. Oop, not RGP, RGB. All right, and so I give it values for red, green, and blue. And usually they're on a scale of 0 to 255, so I'm going to also change this max color value. So I'll say max color value equals 255. And so then if I had values for red, green, and blue, say, let's say 230, uh, 120, um, we'll see what color this is. Uh, so if I type something like that, um, I get this sort of string of what looks like gibberish, but this is actually a code for that color that R can then use. So I copy and paste that. Let's say I want to switch out my red for that color. All right, and I get this kind of rusty orange. And I can even check in something like MS Paint. And so Let's say if I go to edit color and I want to put in that same value that was, uh, let's see, 230, 120. And I go 30, 100, 20. It's that same color. All right, so this will work across all sorts of different software. So now I'd like you to pause the video and try some exercises with colors. So I want you to run this function called magma that's part of the Viridis package. If you pass it the argument 6, it will make you 6 colors. So see what, looks, what it looks like when you just run that function by itself. And use the output of that function will scale color manual to manually assign each location to one of those 6 colors. And then try out the call to RGB function to get RGB values for those colors and um, try them out in like Paint or other software to see if they look like you expect. So one thing that I'd probably want to change in this plot if I was sharing with it with other people would be the axis labels as well as the legend label because I use some abbreviations just to make things easier for me to type in R. But when I have that plot, I want it to be obvious what the different values actually mean. So I can change labels with a function called labs. So I'm going to add that to this current uh, plot that I have. So I'll add a plus sign after the scale color manual function call and then hit enter so that I can make a call to labs. So what I'm going to do is type in the name of the aesthetic and then the name that I want that uh, that aesthetic to have in the plot. So I can say x equals column diameter I had Y as yield for short, but I'm going to say biomass yield. As a plant breeder type person, um, you know, biomass yield and grain yield are two completely different things, so I want to be specific. And I might say color equals location. And I can even put in a main title for it. And so now if I run that command, right now I have everything labeled that, that, the way that I want it. So say I'm happy with this plot now I want to, and I want to save it. The function is ggsave. And that gives me a lot of options. In fact, there are a bunch of file types listed down here that you can pick from. Uh, PDF is a good one. 
uh, some journals will accept PDF, uh, but if you know if they don't, if you want a TIFF or something else, an SVG, it's all here. So, and by default, it will save whatever plot you've plotted last. Right. So I'm going to give a name for this file. Let's say. Uh, cmd by yield.pdf and just to be clear I'll say device equals pdf and because my screen is small it's pretty small right here so maybe I want it a bit bigger so I will say width equals 7 height equals 7 and units equals inches. Please feel free to use centimeters if you know you're anyone other than an American. Uh, or you know if you're an American, that's okay too. I forgive you. In fact, you're probably smart. But um, so I'll save that. It basically redrew the plot, but instead of drawing it here, it drew it to a PDF file. So I can open up that PDF file and I'll shrink it down for you all here. Um, so now, now that's saved to a PDF that I can look at. So this is maybe not quite the scale that I would want in a paper, but it's a good scale for a pre preliminary analysis, you know, showing something to your advisor, um, telling them what you found. Right. If it were for a paper, maybe I would make it three inches by three inches so that the font size would be more appropriate. Okay, so I can almost guarantee there is some burning question you have that I haven't answered in this video, even though it's getting to be a kind of long video. But I hope I've at least shown you sort of the categories of things in ggplot so that you know where to look. For example, if you wanted to change the shape of a point, you might say, hey, I bet there's an aesthetic called shape. Um, in fact, if I look at geom point, the help page, if I scroll down, it will show me what the different aesthetics are. And in fact, there is one called shape. Um, and we have some others here that you might want to explore. And I say, well, if I want to actually set like each of my field trial locations to a particular shape, could I do that with like a scale shape function? And it turns out there are, in fact, functions for, um, you know, scaling to shape, which means, you know, setting a particular value to be associated with a particular shape. Or maybe you're thinking, well, I wanted to plot in a circle instead of on x, y coordinates. Well, that means I need a different coordinate system. So if I look at, you know, coord, oh, there's one called coord polar. I bet that does what I want. Or I want to make some line plots instead of scatter plots. Well, maybe there's a geom line. In fact, there are several line related ones. So you might explore those. Right, and um, again, you might want to go to uh, ggplot2.tidyverse.org to see some of their tutorials. Uh, you might want to Google things. If you Google how do I do such and such in ggplot, you're likely to get an answer. Um, and even, you know, if you look at the list of geoms and the geom that you want isn't there, there are some packages that extend ggplot. So e even doing a Google search, you might find out what those packages are and they might make the plot that you would like. All right, thanks for watching. I hope that was helpful.